Amen. Good morning again. Welcome to church. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, would you turn in them to Ephesians chapter 3? We're going to be in verses 1 through 13 this morning. I'm not sure who's joining us for the first time or who hasn't been here in a while, but we are actually in a series in the book of Ephesians. And we've spent a fair amount of time, in fact, the last couple of weeks, talking about Christ's body, the church. What is the church? Why does it matter? And I let us all know last week that my goal for us in these next few weeks would be that we would leave here with an elevated view of the church, with a higher view of what God is doing in his body, the church. And maybe you remember last week, I talked about the reality that we are the church, that God's people are where God lives. God lives with his people. It's a beautiful thing. But why does it matter if we have an elevated view of the church? Well, as I said last week, I think that our view of the church can be inadequate. I think that's true for me as much as it is for anybody else. I think that we forget how much the church matters to God and that his plan and his purpose is to use the church for his glory. For whatever reason, God has decided that this body of believers is what he is going to use for his glory. I think that we forget how much the church matters to God and or it's even possible that we never knew the importance of the church in the first place. Maybe this for some of us is the first time we're hearing things like this. Jesus himself said this of the church in Matthew chapter 16. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Me meaning this, God's design and plan is to push back darkness it's to establish light and to lead humanity to flourish. And I want us to hear this as clearly as we can. He is using the church to do that plan. He is using the church to accomplish pushing back darkness, establishing light, and leading humanity to flourish. That's a big deal, isn't it? And so some of us, we get bored with Christianity. We just think, what's it about? We, we sort of stare at ourselves in the mirror. And this is a huge plan that God has laid out for the church. We should not be bored by what God is doing. He is using us to push back dark darkness, establish light, and help humanity to flourish. That's a big deal, isn't it? You guys are a talkative bunch. But... Um, what, what matters to God is the church. How do I know this? Well, look with me at Ephesians 5, verse 25. It says this. It'll be on the screen. Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Okay, so the church clearly matters to God to the point that Jesus would give himself up for the church. As we seek to elevate our view of the church, I want us to see today that God's eternal purpose centers on Christ and his church. Let, let me say something that at first might sound a little bit overstated, but I believe it to be accurate, and here it is. If we want our lives to count for eternity, we have got to get God's vision and purpose for the church and then live accordingly. Let me say it again. If we want our lives to count for eternity, then we have got to get God's vision and purpose for the church and then live it out. The, ch the church is a big deal. Last week, we finished chapter 2 of Ephesians, and everything that we studied in chapter 2, today, Paul is going to continue talking about in chapter 3, and he's going to use this word mystery. So before we dive into our text this morning, I think it's important for us to define the word mystery that Paul is going to use. I don't know about you, but when I hear the word mystery, I think of names like Sherlock Holmes or um, the Hardy Boys. Did anyone ever read that series, Hardy Boys? Come on, anyone? Micah, I read it to you. Put your hand up. Um, <clears throat> I, I owe you $5. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> or Adrian Monk. I don't know if you guys ever watched that show, Monk. He's kind of my guy. Or... Um, Datelines. I love a good dateline. Um, but I hear mystery and I think of something dark or obscure or secret or puzzling. Things that are mysterious to me would be inexplicable or even incomprehensible. And while this understanding of the word mystery would be accurate in our English associations, this understanding of the word mystery can be kind of misleading in regard to what Paul means by the word. In fact, He's using the word, which, which is where we get our word mystery, the Greek word mysterion, and it means something that is beyond natural knowledge, but 
It has been opened to us by divine revelation through the Holy Spirit. So in Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, Paul says it like this, the mystery hidden for the ages and generation for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So when we hear the word mystery in our passage today, we need to know that Paul isn't saying that this is something unknown or unknowable. What it means is something that was previously undreamed of, but now it is disclosed to the saints. If you are a follower of Christ, it is disclosed to you. So it's kind of like an open secret. Here in Ephesians, the mystery that Paul's going to talk about was hinted at in verse 10 of chapter 2, where Paul says this, For we are God's workmanship. He starts hinting at this mystery, his masterwork, his new spiritual creations. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says, Brought near by the blood of Christ. And then the mystery is further opened in verse 15 of chapter 2, where we are told that our nearness happened through the creation of a new humanity, the church. Here's what Paul says. He says, in himself, one new man in place of two. Then like we looked at last week, this mystery of the church was described with three gripping images. Maybe you remember, Paul said, we're citizens, we are family, we are being built into a new temple, living stones. God's people is where God lives. We are the church. So this open secret of God's eternal plan is the church. And this mystery is dominating Paul's thoughts still as he begins chapter 3. And today I want to look at verses 1 through 8 very quickly, and then we're going to spend most of our time in verses 9 through 13 looking at the reality that God's eternal purposes center on Christ and the church. Look with me if you will, at verses 1 through 8, quickly, they say this, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though, I am uh, the very least of all the saints— this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So Paul, just to give us an idea of what's happening with him right now, he's having trouble leaving this marvelous subject of the church, this mystery. He, he wants to make it clear to his church and for us here at Hillside today what this mystery is. And so Paul tells us very specifically in verse 6, just so we're all up to speed. I know I've said it a couple times, but look at verse 6. It says this, The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So what is the mystery? I know I've said it already, but let me first tell you what it's not, just so we're all clear. The mystery is not the truth that the Gentiles would turn to God. Salvation had been promised to them in the Old Testament. Maybe you don't know that. The prophet Isaiah said that the Messiah would be a light to the Gentiles. You can read about it in Isaiah 42 through 47. So the mystery was not that the Gentiles would turn to God. The mystery is something greater. Well, what could be greater than every single nation turning to God, knowing God? Here it is. Not only would all the nations come to know him, but both Gentiles and Jews would be joined in the closest possible bond. The mystery is that every tribe and tongue and nation would be unified in the body of Christ, under Christ, in his church. So verse 6 says that the mystery is that Jews and Gentiles will be fellow heirs, they would be members of the same body, and they would be fellow partakers of the promise. And so the open secret, which was not understood in times past, is that Jews and Gentiles are on the exact same footing because of what Jesus Christ has done. 
This mystery came about from their new double union with Christ and with each other. John actually wrote about this phenomenon in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, when he said this, That's, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. So communion with each other, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So he's saying that the closer that we get to God, the closer we are going to get to each other. And I know that we've heard this over and over, in fact, for the last few weeks, but we have to understand this. No Jew or Gentile had ever conceived of such a thing in their wildest dreams. The mystery of Christ bringing together every kind of person into the body is amazing. In all of these truths, this revealed mystery, they cause Paul again to describe for the church in Ephesus and for us here at Hillside, this is very practical this morning, just how important Christ's body, the church, is. And so with the rest of our time this morning, I want to look at verses 9 through 13, and I want our view of the church to be elevated once more as we see that God's eternal purpose is to make known his manifold wisdom through the church. God's eternal purpose is to make known his manifold wisdom through the church. Well, how does God make his manifold wisdom known through Christ's body, the church? We might be surprised by it, but Paul answers that question. He says the church reveals God's manifold wisdom in two different ways today in our passage. Look with me at the first way in verse 9 under this heading. God's manifold wisdom is being revealed to the world through the church, to everyone look at verse 9, it says this, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So this wisdom of God is being revealed, being brought to light to everyone through the mystery of the church, through what God is doing that no one ever thought possible. And we have to hear this because I think that it helps us to understand the gravity of being a part of the body of Christ, the church. We understand that we are citizens, maybe. We understand that we are family, hopefully. We understand that we are being built into a holy temple. But do we understand that God is revealing his plan of salvation to the world through the church? Do we get that? I read a story this week that I I think helps illustrate this point. There's a missionary still living by the name of Johann Lucas. He was serving with the Belgian Evangelical Mission, and he came to the realization that evangelism in Belgium was not really going anywhere. Meaning this, lost people in Belgium were not giving their lives to Jesus Christ because of classic evangelism campaigns. You know, when people were being invited to church or people were going door to door knocking to share their faith, it just wasn't working like it used to. And Belgium had a long historical uh, tradition of Catholicism, and they had even experienced some aggressive cults in their culture. And so they were just a little bit leery of Christianity. They were unreceptive to the gospel because of that. People were unwilling to turn to Christ. And so what do you do when people don't respond to the classic methods of sharing your faith with them. Well, Johann, this missionary desiring to lead people into a relationship with Jesus, was driven to the scriptures, which is obviously a really good place to start. And he came up with a new plan. Here's what he did. First, he gathered together a diverse group of believers. What do I mean by diverse? Well, he gathered together Belgian believers and Dutch people who were followers of Christ, and then American people who were followers of Christ, whoever would come. Secondly, he had this diverse group rent a house, and they lived together in this house for seven months. So as you can imagine, there was friction amongst these different kinds of people who love Jesus. They were from different cultures. They probably all had different methods of doing things. Do I take my shoes off when I enter the house? Do I not? How do we do the dishes around here? Things like that. Anything that would happen if you had a roommate, whether diverse or not. But they were different cultures, they had different methods, and this friction among them caused them to pray and happily to live in victory with one another, even though there were some tough moments together. Following this seven-month experience, they um, began to see amazing fruit. 
And I think that this is so cool, but outsiders literally called this group of people the people who love each other. Why? Well, because they were living out the mystery of the church in front of people. Christ was drawing his people together, and as they drew near to him, they were living together in unity. And so God's manifold wisdom was seen in their unity. They were living out the words and the promises of Jesus. Look at John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. Jesus says this, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I want you to hear me clearly on this. As we live out the mystery of Christ, making us one, then we will win the world for Christ. And, and I'm convinced of this more than ever, that it isn't big conferences, and it isn't great sermons, and it isn't philanthropic projects that expose God's manifold wisdom. All of those things are good. Don't hear me wrong. But the world isn't drawn to programs. They're not drawn to organizations. They aren't drawn to philanthropy. I think sometimes this is, I'm going to get on a soapbox for a second. I'll do it over here. Um, I, I don't know how many times, and I'm guilty of it too, where I think, man, if people just see me loving the person that is hard to love out there, then they'll come to Christ. I, I, it might be true, but that's not what Jesus said. He said, they will know you are disciples by your love for each other. The world is drawn to brothers and sisters. The world is drawn to the family of believers. We must realize then that dynamic evangelism will take place as we preach and live out these two things, Christ and the church. Paul calls us to the power of the two in concert, and so God's manifold wisdom is seen by our world in the church. But he doesn't stop there. He says there is another group watching the church. Who else could be in the group if we've just talked about the world and everyone? Dogs? I mean, like, what are we talking about here? Who else could there be besides everyone in the world? Well, Paul kind of surprises us, I think, when he says this. God's manifold wisdom is being revealed to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places through the church. Look at me at verses, with me at verses 10 through 12. It's gonna, we're going to focus on verse 10, but 10 through 12 say this. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Okay, what does that mean? Well, Paul is saying God has a glorious purpose for the church, and the church is definitely to be a witness to God's manifold wisdom in the world, but there's more. The church is also to be a display of God's wisdom to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Meaning this, the angels and the demons see God's wisdom and power in his church. Most of us don't think about rulers and authorities that we cannot see. But Paul here brings them into the center of God's eternal purpose. Let me try to explain what Paul is saying here, because I'm going to be honest with you. This feels a little weird, doesn't it? The Apostle Paul is saying this, Ephesian Christians and a Christians gathered together today in this congregation of Hillside Community Church, you need to understand that it is God's purpose for you as the church to be exhibit A of God's wisdom to the angelic powers, the principalities, and the authorities. God has put you on the stage of history. The history of the Christian church is this is, I think John Stott said this, it's the graduate school to the angels. And as weird as this might sound to you, the inescapable conclusion is that the angels watch us because we are showing them the manifold or the many-colored wisdom and power of God. The church reveals God's wisdom to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places, and I think that this is really important for us to know. This is not the only place in Scripture that teaches this idea. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, Peter describes how the prophets searched intently 
to understand the prophecies regarding Christ that have now been revealed in the gospel. And then he says this at the end of verse 12, things into which angels long to look. Which literally means that the angels stoop down to look. So picture with me, if you can, angels bent over and intently observing the teachings and the actions of God's people. Your audience is far bigger and more observant than any of you realize because you, as a church, are proclaiming the manifold wisdom of God to even the angels and the demons. And I want us to understand this, and so I might belabor the point, but you're like, what's new? This is huge. God displays his wisdom to the church, in the church, so that the worship of heaven will be white hot with admiration and wonder. Try and understand this with me. No angel has ever sung the lyrics that we sing when we sing songs like Amazing Grace. Here's what I mean. No angel will ever sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Why? Angels are not wretches. They have never been lost. This is our song. And so the angels see the church and they see the wisdom of God and they see his mercy and they see his grace and they see his love and they see his justice and they see his power and all of those things are magnified in the substitutionary death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The angels see wisdom and grace the way, in the way in which he saves the church by justifying ungodly men and women from all nations, tribes, and tongues on the basis of faith alone through Jesus Christ alone and the angels love to stoop down and get as close as they can and see the manifold wisdom of God as he has prepared and saved and gathered his church. And they see, man, that looked impossible, but look what God is doing among them. It's amazing to them to watch God work in his body. But what about the fallen angels? What about the demons? Well, they see the church, and it reminds them of their impending doom. This verse really got my imagination going this week, which is very dangerous for you guys. Not really me. I don't, it doesn't bother me at all. But I, I'm not even 100% sure if this will make sense. But imagine with me the conversations that the fallen angels have as they, as they have watched God work through history. You and I could jump into any story of the Bible, but let's just stop, start with the birth of Jesus, right? Imagine the demon saying, well, it looks like we've got this whole thing covered. We're going to shut it down because Herod has decided to kill all the boys under the age of two. And so there's no need for us to worry about this incarnation thing. And then what happens? Mary and Joseph take off to Egypt and they escape and their plan doesn't work. The demon's plan doesn't work. Fast forward to Jesus in the garden, and they think, okay, we've got him now. Judas has betrayed him. He's kissed him, and he's turned him over. It is only a matter of time before we finish him off completely. And then Peter, one of his best followers, has deserted him. He's denied him. He's even saying, I don't know who he is. This whole thing is crumbling. It is absolutely over. We will defeat God. And then the demons say, look, they crucified him. He's finished. They even put a huge stone in front of the tomb. But oh wait, he's alive. And his disciples are back in the game all of a sudden. And Peter, who denied him, is now preaching this sermon and 3,000 people have come to faith. This is no good. But then they're happy again, the demons, and they say, we've got Saul of Tarsus. Saul hates the church. We can use him. He'll be perfect. He will destroy the church. Oh wait, now Saul is a follower of Christ. He's Paul now. And then we remember Jesus saying, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. My point is this. No matter where or when in history the forces of darkness seek to do their worst, God is accomplishing his eternal purpose. He has revealed this in and through the person of his son. And this is huge for us. And now he is revealing his purpose in his manifold wisdom in his church. And this morning, as believers in Vermilion, South Dakota, we ought to take Paul's letter to Ephesus and bow down under the weight of this truth. 
that God is actually doing things in his church that sound the alarm for everything that is or ever has been opposed to him. God is saving the most unlikely people. He is putting together companies and congregations and assemblies that are proclaiming his manifold wisdom, and even the demons see this, and they tremble. No matter where or when in history the forces of darkness seek to do their worst, God is accomplishing his eternal purposes. He has revealed this in and through the person of his son, and today, Paul says, his manifold wisdom is seen in his body, the church. Even the angels and the demons are watching. Paul finishes up this section of our passage today with verse 13, and he writes this. He says, so, so because of all of these things we've talked about, how big the church is, I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So Paul knows that the Ephesian Christians are in danger of becoming downhearted. Their pastor has been arrested, and he's awaiting trial. They hear what he's going through, and they know that they might be next. They feel for him. They've prayed for him, and it seems like their prayers have not been answered. And so they're beginning to wonder about it all. They're starting to ask questions like this. Does this church thing even work? It appears to them that God's plan has failed. His apostle is imprisoned, but Paul wants them to know that there is a divine purpose at work. And guess what? It is much bigger than him, and it is much bigger than them. The church is God's manifold wisdom, and he is at work through his church. And a big view of God's church is essential when things are hard, when things are rough. This made me think this week that it's easy to be faithful in the midst of obvious success, isn't it? It's easy for us to be faithful. Yeah, God must really be behind that because the, the church is full. Look at all these people. And all of you guys are like, I know my seat got taken. <laughs> I don't have to save a seat because I've got this spot right here. But um, it's easy for us to be faithful when the church is bursting at the seams, when your bank account is good, when everything is going well. But can we be faithful when we cannot see immediate results? Will we be faithful to share the gospel when we do it and no one believes? Will we be faithful when we're the only one being faithful? Paul, Paul's point in this passage and why he's telling all of this to his church is that faithfulness is going to happen if we remember that there is an eternal purpose at work in what is happening here. And he is convinced that faithfulness to God's plan, it will bear fruit. Not not necessarily today, maybe not even tomorrow, but in eternity it will. Worship team, you guys can come on up. As we close out this passage this morning, let me share with you what goes through my mind as a pastor when I read a text like this one. This this text, it, it scrapes the heavens. It it, it almost feels hard to grasp. It's talking about God's eternal purposes, things that, that, that don't feel as tangible to me. And I wonder, as I'm sure if you do, when I read a text like this, how do these verses relate to people in this church who are struggling with troubled marriages or trying to raise kids or worried about paying bills or juggling very busy schedules, or who are grappling with the power of the temptations of sin, which I bet we all are. And thinking about God's eternal purpose, it might be interesting to theologians. It could be interesting to philosophers, but how does this passage help people who wrestle with the kinds of ordinary challenges that life throws at them? How do these truths that Paul sets before us here help us to live more godly lives now? And as I thought about this question this week, here's the conclusion that I came to. Paul is again raising our vision for what God is doing in the church. And all of what we study today demands a view of the church that is so high that it challenges belief. And when our view of the church is raised, then everything else falls into its proper position. When our view of the church is raised, then we will understand that the church is central to our Christian living. 
When we understand this, it will change the way in which we live. I imagine you're still saying, I don't get it. How? How is that true? Well, I read a story this week that I think illustrates this for us well, and maybe you've heard this story before, and this is not a true story. It's just a story. But here it is. There were three men working on a stone pile at a construction site. A curious man who was walking by asked the first worker that he saw, what are you doing? And the first worker replied, I'm chiseling stone. Trying for a better answer, the man asked the second worker, what are you doing? And the second worker answered, I'm earning a living. Trying one last time, the man asked the third worker, what are you doing? And the third man dropped his sledgehammer, stood up straight, and with a gleam in his eye, he said, I am building a great cathedral. All three of those men were doing the exact same job. But only one of them saw how his role fit into a larger, more important vision. <laughs> how inspiring. I, I think sometimes we get bored with the Christian life because we just think it's about us. For us today, this passage is meant to help us see how our lives fit into God's glorious, eternal purpose in the church. And I'm convinced that when we see this truth, a high view of what God is doing through us will help us very practically to deal with life's difficult trials. A bigger view of the church is central to our practical Christian belief. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much again for your word. God, thank you that uh, through it you challenge us to see that you are working out your manifold wisdom. You are making it clear through this body, through your body, the church. Father, I pray again today that we would leave with a higher view. And God, I pray that we would be a people that see ourselves of some, uh, as a part of something that you are doing, something that you are working through. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.